G'day guys, my name is John. I'm the Beverage Innovation Manager for Phantom and Tonic. This is Jane from Difference Guy. Jane, how are hey, you? I'm good, thanks. How are you doing? I'm oh, good for you. I'm very well, thank you very much. Thanks for coming to Gym Live. We've got eight drinks to go through. So lucky you, you deserve the best. It's probably best that we dive right in. Yeah, absolutely. We're gonna start with a Negroni. Good drink to start with. Cool, what gin are we gonna use? We're going with Tanglin, which is um, a gin from Singapore. It's actually one of the first gins that was ever made in Singapore. So they're a real treat for you. Um, and we're gonna mix that obviously with some... Campari. Campari. Everyone's had a Negroni before? Yes, great. And obviously some sweet vermouth. So that's a really traditional drink made in three equal parts. Um, we're starting with it because it's an aperitif. So it's really gonna open our palates and get us ready for the rest of the tasting. Um, a little bit more on the gin we're starting with. So this gin has nine botanicals and it smells of what's like pepper, ginger, chili. It's a really nice spicy gin. And you're gonna taste some uh, more like citrus on the palate. So kaffir limes, mandarin pills. Uh, it's gonna go really well in a Negroni because it's got that nice strong back palate that's gonna come through um, our mixes. So. I know everyone's had a Negroni, but, and I'm sure you've all got crystal clear ice cubes at home. If you don't, don't worry, it's just frozen water. Jane's just fancy. Yeah. She deserves the best. This is for me. Cool. If everyone's stirring at home, you want the longest spoon possible. You can't get through airport security with them, but they do make you look a little bit cooler at home. Help us have one more giant piece of ice. Yeah, I'll try and find you one that's not frozen to the others. Give me two, both. two. Yeah, give me both of them. This is so much easier with wood. <laughs> I don't know if you're getting a lot of uh, surface uh, time there, John. This is probably quite loud. What we're going to do here is stir it down. So all we want to do is add a little bit of water and get the temperature right. But we're going to serve it over ice so you don't need to over dilute it. Don't worry about that. Yeah. Ice yes, please. And what's our garnish? The Italians will tell you that it could be garnished with an olive or a wedge of orange or a peel of orange, but you just got to make a personal preference here. What do you like? Orange. Good choice. I like the aromas of peel, so we're just going to use a potato peeler and get a nice peel of orange. That didn't work. I use a knife. You can if you like. It's been years since I cut myself. So you're going to move the pick there. Yeah, that white stuff at the bottom of a peel, that's gross. You don't want that. You just, it's really bitter. And we've already added Campari, so we'll just move away from it. So we just want nice big orange bits. And that's very awkward. You sure we take it out? No. It's my first shift. Oh, great drink to start off with. And you can just express some of those orange oils over the top. You can really see them coming out, actually. It smells really nice. Yeah. And you can just rub that around the edge of your glass so your guests at Christmas really know what they're getting involved in. And then you get something that looks very proud, very Italian. There you go. Thank you. Cheers. Beautiful. Mm, that's a good one. So it's we actually got a, we got a question from the audience. Uh, can you repeat the recipe, please? Yeah, sure. So a Negroni is equal parts. So normally you do about 25 ml gin, 25 ml Campari, and 25 ml sweet vermouth. But it's actually a really good cocktail to batch up if you've got larger quantities. So you could prepare this um, like a head of uh, guests coming over, do a whole bottle, stick it in the fridge, and then when everyone comes over, it's just pour, pour, pour. Um, and you can leave that kind of up to like five days in the fridge. It's going to be totally fine. So really nice, easy drink. But yeah, equal parts. So you can't really go wrong if you want a bigger or a smaller one. Cool. Okay. Next drink. Next drink. Let's move into some gin and tonics. Yeah, perfect. We're going to start off with a Swedish gin. Beautiful. Oh, no. yeah. So this gin um, is actually really traditional. It's kind of like a, a nice dry gin. You've got lots of coriander, lots of nice peppery notes. Pardon me. Reaching. No drama. Do you want some ice fat? Yes, please. I don't think I'm going to have You're one. at home and you're an adult, so you can just use 30 mils or it's Friday and if your rugby league team's already left the competition, just be a little more heavy-handed. Perfect. Beautiful. And what tonic are we popping with this one? Oh, well, it would pair best with a Indian tonic. Benjamins. 
Yeah. Everyone's had Fentimans? Of course you have. The best tonic in the world. Just gonna pour it straight up there? Yeah. Now, if the guys have got the packs at home, how much should they be popping in? So, I think that uh, Fentimans bottle holds 200 mils. So, you would say half the bottle for 100 mils into your serve should be pretty pretty perfectly diluted. Yes, yeah, so this is a really traditional gin and tonic. Like I said, because that gin has a lot of those really traditional um, botanical notes. So, we're gonna go in with citrus. Citrus, lemons. They're really cheap this time of year and then they get cheaper as it gets warmer, so that's nice. And watch like a nice nice wedge. I like a wedge. Nothing dainty, doesn't need to look elegant, just needs to stand up on its own. Very cool. Perfect cool. with the eyes. And then because you deserve the best, bit of cracked pepper in there. Yeah, definitely. So that kind of complements the notes you're gonna have in the gin. So you've got it on the aroma as well when you dive into this gin and tonic, and that's why we just crack a bit of black pepper over. Beautiful. Oh, you have this one because sure. I've got my Negroni. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Well, Question so to the audience. Yeah. Uh, which gin did you just use for the second one? Herno. So it looks like this. And it's spelled with an H in your kit. And it's got a normal out in it, which are those two funny dots. Comes from Sweden. Really well made. And they do a lot of really cool stuff with some local Australian distillers as well. So always keep an eye out for it. Great. That was such a good gin and tonic. Let's make another one. Okay, we're going to go for an American gin this time. So we're using Aviation, which I'm sure everyone will have heard of because Ryan Reynolds is obviously the face of it, um, which makes it pretty iconic. And he's actually just done uh, lots of stuff on um, advertising their new big bottle, kind of making jokes about the fact that it's helping parents with their kids at home um, with their education there. But we've only got the... Oh, that's empty as well. Sorry. Been, uh... <laughs> that's okay, we've got a little pause. Perfect. Keep the one. same tonic on you. And, uh, and this is this one close to a bartender's heart. About seven years ago, gin didn't really exist. It was sort of beef eater, and if you wanted something better, it was probably Bombay Sapphire. And this is one of the first gins that came into the country as like an alternative premium. So it's really exciting for a lot of people in, in major cities here. So uh, we've always been quite nostalgic about this. Can I have another yeah. big giant piece of ice? Well, the only problem is all my oh, yeah. ice is now fused together. <laughs> so we're just going to have a little detail. <laughs> you can be a bit clever. Yeah, what's your choice? Um, while we uh, sort of uh, take apart our ice cubes, um, it's very soaked as your life. <laughs> I suppose just talk to you a little bit about this gin. It actually has a lot of like um, minty spearmint notes coming through. The brand um, really hero, I guess, the floral lavender element. But when I taste this one, I almost get like a, like a peppermint tic tac sort of um, vibe going. It's really clean, lovely gin. There we go. Sort it yourself. Beautiful. Take the rest of that bottle. Give yourself as much as you like. And garnish. We spoke to Ryan and we said, Ryan, what, what, how do you garnish your aviation? And he said, well, John, obviously it's going to be same again with a good piece of lemon that sticks up for itself. But also, if anyone's got some <laughs> rosemary or what is like a rosemary flower, big piece of fresh lavender, that would be fantastic. That looks yeah, that's that nice. Like yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, there you go. How about, um, we we uh, switch on cocktail candy. Yeah. Put a zoom in on, uh... Have a look at these drinks we've got here. So I'm just going to cool. pop that one there, and you can see the the lavender there. Which martini do you want to make? Or are we going to stay We're on gin, gonna... and gin and tonic? You want to you want to mix it up a bit? I don't mind. I'm in your hands. Well, I think we should do one more gin and tonic because the next gin is actually Archie Rose, which is a local gin. Uh, it's really. So yeah, sold. We both love it. Um, so Archie Rose is one of Sydney's first distilleries in over 100 years. And they're really active in the community. So when the bushfires were on, they actually went up to the Hunter Valley and purchased loads of um, grapes that had smoke taint. And we're going to use them to make the base of alcohol. So they're, I don't know, just a really lovely Sydney um, local brand. And everything they do tastes so good. So and if you do live in this fine city and you have seen the Harbour Bridge and you have seen the Opera House and you're looking for something else to do, Head over to Roseberry and get some incredible service. Yeah, you, these you can go people. sit in the bar, drink the gins, eat some cheese. They've got some whiskey as well. So, uh, yeah, definitely support local. All right, and we now have a new tool for uh, the ice separation. Incredible. We Who makes these? Oh, I think uh, Uber Bartles. They're so clever, those guys. <laughs> They've thought of everything. Well, that was you simple. To... Yes, please. While you guys are cleaning it up, we've got a comment from Brett saying, 
Yeah, Jane and Ryan, you guys are the best mixologists ever. So, uh. <laughs> well, I don't like to invite the term mixologist, but <laughs> the James Bond of gin and tonics, I'll, I'll take. Yep. Your words. Cool. Archie Rose, so this time we're going to get a little sexier on the tonic water. So, we're going to use Fentiman, uh, Fentiman's Valencian Orange. Ooh. So, oranges from Valencia, yeah, Spain. Ooh. If you actually fly in there, it's like orange grows everywhere. I'm just, you know, very well traveled. <laughs> You're from England or something? <laughs> no. Um, okay, so what are we garnishing this with? So, we should, we've already got an incredible gin and we've got a big, citrusy, beautiful Spanish warm climate tonic water. And fairly intuitively, we should just put some mint and lime in there. Yes, yeah, so actually, one thing I didn't say about Archie Rose, which is uh, important, is the one gin in our tasting today that has Australian botanicals. Um, so you've got lemon myrtle, but you also have um, some of the um, blood lime and some river mint. So it's going to um, have a lot of, a, I guess, a more of a unique palette uh, as opposed to anything we're tasting today. Although some of the gins we're experiencing a bit later on also do have, thanks, John, uh, native botanicals from their own country. So we'll, we'll hit those later. It's a world tour after all. Yeah, that smells beautiful. It's so <laughs> fragrant. It's yeah. annoying that he did that. But if you like get your mint and give it a little slap in your hand uh, or just, you know, annoy someone next to you, you're going to get a really beautiful bouquet. Yeah, you can see bartenders just really abuse it. You don't need to do that. Just discipline it a little bit and you get in all it takes is a tiny amount of abuse to release all those oils and then it's really aromatic. Can I yeah. This one? yeah, you can have that one. Yeah. Do you wanna do one more gin and tonic or do you wanna go on? We'll do the last this it's the last gin and tonic before we hit the martinis. Keep that tonic water on you, we'll stick with that. Yep, and you've got okay. you never use your hands. Never use your hands. That's definitely yours. <laughs> Thanks. Um, cool. Last one? Last one is Roku, which is a Japanese gin. And this is another one that I said um, it uses Japanese botanicals. So Roku is six in Japanese, and there's six native botanicals in there, as well as 14 more common ones you'll find uh, in a lot of European gins. So pour it all in. What's your sharing? Then split it in half? Or? So um, on the nose Maybe with this one, sure. you're going to get those actually are quite traditional, I guess you think of Japanese um, aromas. Cherry blossom is there. It's quite a floral gin. Uh, on the palate, though, you are going to get that backbone of a bit more spice, which is nice. So it's not too, um, I guess, sweet as a gin. Beautiful. Garnish? Speaking of spice, yeah. I think we've written down some mandolin ginger. Mandolin is just a fancy word for thin. So I'm just going to cut some fresh ginger up. Yeah, mandolining is a very dangerous art. That, uh, I'd recommend just using a normal knife. Yeah, and even the it's risk. Question from the audience, when you're making the Negroni, do you use a sweet or a dry vermouth? Sweet. Yeah, so that's um, going to be red coloured. It's traditionally more from um, Italy. You've already got a lot of bitterness coming from the Campari and Negroni, so you don't want to be adding in like a dry vermouth that's going to, I mean, everyone's palate dependent, but I would really recommend adding in a little bit of sweetness to, to counteract that quite aggressive bitterness. The Negroni should start with really strong gin, really bit of Campari, really sweet vermouth, and the first sip should be a bit yeah. And the last sip should, should be like, I need another one. Yeah. And it should evolve all the way That's through. That's the good thing about serving over ice. The same as an old fashioned. The first one's aggressive. By the end, you're like, yeah, ready to go. You're done. Ginger. So good. Perfect. Okay, that's our gin and tonics done. So obviously those are really, obviously easy drinks to assemble, but you add in nice ice, you're adding in some fun garnishes, and all of a sudden you've elevated that serve from something that could be quite watery and like uninspiring to something that's really you know, exciting to have, share with friends. Do you mind, before you jump back in, uh, just walk us through the first gin and tonics and the bottles? Yeah, yeah the absolutely. So we had the um, Hano, which is the Swedish one, and we've gone for the traditional... Indian tonic? Yeah. Then we have the Aviation. I'll grab for you. Yeah. And that, again, is with the, the classic Ventimans. Um, yeah, Archie Rose with the Valencian orange. And finally, the Roku, again, with the Valencian orange. Is that the best tonic water you've ever had? Definitely. Ah, oh, I thought so. Good. Beautiful. All right, we'll disassemble this. Yeah. Another question that's come from the audience. When you're picking a gin, what are the things that, you know, you should be looking out for? You know, When you're making a home garden, what do you look out for? And when you're cooking your bolognese at home, what do you look out for? It's really just dependent. I put Angostura bitters in my bolognese. You're a vegetarian. It's just, uh, it's all personal taste. So gin is like 
quite literally neutral grain spirit made out of something that might look like honey wheats. This is some wheat in the jar here. And then all that we need to do is add some of these juniper berries to that crude vodka and we end up with essentially gin. And then you can put a garden salad in a still and call it, you know, yeah, because there's traditional stuff and there's kind of new world. I think that's the, the major difference you're sort of working with. So the new world stuff is like your Archie Rose. You're playing with botanicals that haven't traditionally been around. Uh, and that's really fun to explore. I would really recommend everyone getting into the new stuff. But then, you know, there's nothing wrong with loving beef eater and Bombay Sapphire. And there's really traditional gins that like, you know, kind of pave the way, I guess. They're not um, maybe as exciting because they're not come with this new gin generation, but there's nothing wrong with this juniper, citrus, coriander, really traditional notes that are going to bring out um, all the great elements in a tonic. So explore, have fun, and maybe go to some gin tastings where you don't always have to, you know, get the huge bottle and you can try lots of different things and see what works for your palate. Uh, beautiful. Yeah, develop mm -hmm. an alcohol dependency and you'll get there. <laughs> Pretty much. No. What do, you, what do you need to drink? Um, I'm going to, well, let's do a martini. So. Okay. Martinis are kind of complex in the way that they're a very simple drink, but when you're adding your vermouth, everyone likes a different kind of quantity. So it's basically gin and dry vermouth. Um, it's really famous, for example, Churchill used to say he'd drink from the bottle of gin and nod in the direction of France, which is how dry he liked it. And when we say wet and dry, that's the amount of vermouth you're putting in. So we're going to start with a wet martini. And it's actually a really good one to start earlier on. So if you're having cocktails at like 4 or 5 p.m., you probably don't actually want a dry like a bone dry martini because that's just cold gin it's going to be really aggressive if you've got a lovely vermouth to play with um I, i'd really recommend starting with something wet so that's what we're going to do uh, and these are the vermouths so you should all have one uh in your kit yeah so you should have cavalin which is what how we're going to make our wet martini which tastes a lot like what do you what does Cavalin oh, taste the, like? the gin. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? What does a martini taste like? Um, okay, so Cavalin is a Taiwanese um, gin, and actually they're really famous for making whiskey. So this is their first foray into gin, um, and it is made with a lot of like kind of tropical extracts. So you've got some papaya there, you've got um, kumquat peel. So quite a, I guess, a bold gin. Right. So again, the martini is very personal, but we want to make a wet one, so we're going to be more heavy-handed with our dry vermouth. So we're going to add our gin. I'm going to leave myself a little bit so I can play with it a little bit more. And then I'm going to be quite heavy handed with the vermouth. I'm going to use about a third of that bottle that you've got. Beautiful. Stir that down as well. Well, it's just stir stirring. Can you have a look at the bottle for the cabling? Yeah, absolutely. Where's that bottle? On the wall. Oh. There we go. So they, um, the guys who made this said they wanted it to be like diving into a crystal clear pool and that, that really refreshing serve. And you can see how they've gone to the design there. It's quite a evocative of that messaging. You're going to under dilute more than you're going to over dilute. So don't be scared of water. A grey martini should just taste like the best glass of water you've ever had. You just want something that's really cold, Really refreshing, but just like a little bit perfumed and cool. All right. You can chill your glass down and things, but we're all friends here and we're just going to move on so you can get a drink in your face a lot faster. Where are the uh, this... vermouths from? Australia. Yeah, these ones are actually Australian vermouths. Um, we're doing much better in Australia with making our own vermouths. So it's actually, again, supporting local. You can have a lot of fun playing with these ones. Can you try that for me? Yeah. And see if you need some more vermouths or if you need some more water. Um, no, I think that's pretty good for me. I like that I can taste the vermouth. Beautiful. And speaking of those tropical fruits and things, I think that we'd be tempted to garnish with some citrus. Again, the martini is so personal. You can put olives in it. You could put onions in it. You could put a papaya in there if you really wanted to. Pickle it as you like. But... Jane's, yeah. Jane's traditional, so she just likes lemon peel. These, um, all these different garnishes give the martini a different name. So if you hear like a Gibson martini, that's with the onion. A, like a dirty martini, that's with olive brine in it. So there's so many variations. Um, so I, I would say don't ever worry about sort of getting a bit creative with this and, and maybe st like steering yourself gently away from that traditional element because you'll probably find something that really suits your palate. If you're 
were drinking them in the 90s, they would have all had blue cheese in them. But thank <laughs> God we've all moved away from that. I actually don't mind that. <laughs> See, and then you put that lemon in. It, obviously, the aroma is now so different. And it really adds another element to the drink. Mm. All right, well, should we do a, a, a dry one now so that we can show the guys what that's like? That makes a lot of sense. Let's do a Churchill style one. Churchill, we're going to nod in the, do you know which direction France is in? Um, I barely know. We're, getting, we're <laughs> being told it's just in. France is over there, so that's good. No, I, okay. don't even, I don't even know where the Harbour Bridge is. I was on my phone in an Uber on the way here, so I'm just not even sure where we are right now. Let's not tell them. Um, okay, so we're going with a gin from Tel Aviv now, and this actually is a really cool gin because they source all of the botanicals from the local markets. I've never been, but I have like a really idealized sense of what that's like. It's sort of a heady market. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Spicy. <laughs> so it's called Milk and Honey, um, the gin. And this one actually has some lavender again. So I think we've we experienced that in a few of the gins today. We had the aviation um, and now this one. So a really nice note there. Obviously, you don't want to be too heavy handed with lavender. You don't want to start smelling sort of like a palm of violet, but this one does it really well. And we're doing more dry vermouth, but this time because it's a dry martini, we're only going to put a little bit in. So we have some left over and I've been a little bit heavy handed with, with the gin because our ratios want to be much more gin to the vermouth. So just a dash of vermouth in here. So we've got a question from home. Is there any milk or honey in this gin? No, no there isn't. Um, milk and honey, I can't tell you exactly where this brand called it that, but it's... Um, it's a type of shampoo. <laughs> it's it's also a, a really famous bar that used to open in New York in the early um, 2000s and it really revolutionized cocktail bars because cocktails went through a really rough time in the 80s and 90s. I mean, there's some great drinks, but there was a lot some of great really... Tom Cruise movies. And some great Tom Cruise movies. There's a lot of really terrible, terrible cocktails that came out of that era. And this guy called Sasha Petrowski opened up a bar called Milk and Honey and he just brought it right back to the classics, right back to how people used to drink in the 1920s. Well, that's, pro that's prohibition. Uh, before that, even, and, and went back to that really classic definition of what a cocktail is uh, and how cold it should be and how every element should be so considered the ice, the citrus, should be fresh, um, no, more, no more mixed um, pre batched juice. So in that's. This, in yeah. this hemisphere, we serve clockwise, but in America, they serve counterclockwise. I'm hearing uh, milk and honey is also, that they're also a whiskey distillery. Oh, okay, cool. That so makes sense. So when we were smelling it, it does smell quite malty. So I would imagine that they make their gin from the same thing that they make their scotch or scotch star whiskey out of. Yeah, do you have the we showing the bottle? Yeah, it's there. Oh, that's there. Uh, another question from the audience is, uh, what are the key botanicals in milk and honey? Um, we have the key botanicals just here. Oh, actually, I don't think I have that information to hand. Secret. <laughs> we'll have to, um... Yeah. Well, one of them is zata. Zata? Which, which we know is a spice that's on a lot of Middle Eastern foods. Oh. It actually is a, a herb grown in the Middle East and uh, yes. obviously native to um, to Israel where milk and honey is and they use that, they use that zata in, as one of the botanicals. That's really cool. Did everyone catch that? Zata? Yeah. Smells and tastes like a curry. Goes great with malted barley. Perfect. Yeah, it's a single malt gin, so they're kind of playing off that um, that whiskey element, which is a, really similar to the Cavalan that we tried earlier, as well. Three olives is good. One is fine. Never four. If you're going to do any more than that, make sure they're prime numbers. But a good martini should be done in three sips. So you basically have an olive between each sip. Makes sense because you've got to get it done while it's cold. Otherwise, you're drinking warm gin. That's silly. Beautiful. Yeah, one's yours. Go on. Um, okay, we have one last cocktail to make, which... One more. One more. Oh. Um, so we need another glass, actually. This is a gin and it, or kind of a riff on a martinez. Yeah. I'm going to uh, grab you a glass. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it on ice. Before um, you guys jump in that last cocktail, what's, um, tell us your favourite cocktail each. Gin and tonic. That's an easy That's answer. so boring, I know, but like you just got to have one. And like we could argue what a cocktail is, but I think it's just anything that's been had some love poured into it and has more than three ingredients. So I think ice, as we've said, ice is important. Garnish is important. The tonic, the quality of your tonic water is important. Your gin is important. I think that if you can, it's, it sounds easy to do, but if you can balance those things into a gin and tonic, 
you're probably the greatest bartender on the face of the earth because uh, I've had some bad ones. Yeah, definitely. I think I've got to the, maybe two answers to that. I have a late night cocktail that I love, which is a Sazerac. I prefer mine with straight cognac, very, very cold. Um, but it is strong and it is not a, a nice drink to have in the early evening. So I actually love a Negroni and I love riffs on Negronis. Like I love using a slow gin sometimes. Um, I love batching that up, taking it on holiday and, um, you know, enjoying it at Airbnb. So that's a, it's really classic for me. Anything that's easy to mix, especially when you're bartending at home. I don't want to be standing in the kitchen sort of trying to fiddle with things while all my guests are having a really nice time at the dinner table and I'm feeling excluded. So that's definitely where I tend to make my decisions on what I want to drink. <laughs> Ready Who asked the question? What's their favorite cocktail? Uh, I will ask him. Let me know. Type away. So, did you say you want to do this over ice? Yeah, let's do it over ice. Okay. There's nothing wrong with having a martini on the rocks either. And there's nothing wrong with having a martini with tonic. And there's nothing wrong with making the gin and it or the martinez on ice. And we're going to do it because we spent a huge amount of money on this ice. So, we're going to get it done. Oh, God. I'm getting a, a martini with capsicum. Go on. Oh, yeah, I'd be into that. I love green capsicum, so. She's been talking about green capsicum all day. It's unbelievable. I'm over it. So, so really, stop touching my eyes with your hands. I'm going to take this drink. Um, Kiel. Okay, so a gin in it or a martinez, whatever you kind of want to go with. This is actually like the precursor to a martini, so it's been around a lot longer, and this is with sweet vermouth. So going back to the vermouth we had with the Campari, sorry, with the Negroni, but there's no Campari in it. Um, it's going to be, I guess, sweeter, easier to drink a little bit. Like the, a lot of the herbaceous notes of the dry vermouth are going to be, I guess, presented in a more um, easy to quaff manner. Is that yeah. a good, good way to describe it? Yeah. I think bartenders have been arguing about what came first, the martini or the martinez for a uh, hundred years. And that's about 99 years too long. And the faster they stop talking about it, the faster we can start drinking them. And that's just a really good way to live. So it was definitely before. <laughs> just if anyone with a moustache is watching, it was before. It was quite clearly before. Answer, done. Um, look, again, it's a personal thing. It's totally up to you. But I like mine in, say, five parts gin, two parts vermouth. So if you're using a tablespoon, five of them, and two vermouth. If you're using a ladle, five ladles of gin, two ladles of vermouth. Um, if you've got multiple of these packs, then they should be measured out for you. But yeah. I'm going to say five. Yes, yeah, so just to touch on the gin that we've just put in there as well. What's this? Yeah, this is an English gin. So we finally sort of got back to that, I guess, that original country where gin is so famous from. This is a family-owned company. It's their um, Blackberry gin, isn't it? Yes, the Blackberry gin, which is actually going to go really well with the sweet vermouth, I think. Yeah. Um, so we've got a lot of juniper and citrus on the nose still. It's not like it's one of those gins that have completely moved away from what gin is. It's got a bit of flavour, but still, um, yeah, still ginny. And you're going to get a lot of, obviously, like floral notes and um, berries on the palate. So whilst you guys are spinning up, we got some comments and questions coming in. Yep. First one's a request. Can you uh, say hi to Sandra Hill? Good day, Sandra. Hi, Hill. Sandra Hill. How are you? See you later. <laughs> awesome. A uh, question that's come from the YouTube channel is, um, what makes uh, Fentiman the best tonic? Oh, I'm so glad you asked, Siobhan. So I would say that soft drinks are bad for you. And I would say that most of them, and I hope no one from Coca-Cola is listening, but it, probably big stainless steel tanks, filled with sugar and flavoring. I would say that the best beers in the world and the best Italian wines in the world are made with like a great raw product with great sugars that ferment away and become these bubbly little yeasty things. And Fentimins is made in a very similar manner. So what they do with gin in mind, because only psychopaths just drink tonic, but the drink is gin and tonic. So with that in mind, Fentimins would get these big containers with natural surrounding yeast and they would start off with a little bit of uh, raw cane, which is the best sugar you can get. And they start off with the greatest spring water that you can find. And then they add the similar botanicals to a classic gin. So they add in juniper berries, which are these weird berries that make gin taste the way it does. They add in the conchona bark, which I've got a little bit of here. And you can buy in Australia. I won't say where. And But it, you do run the risk of killing yourself if you make your home gin and tonic, because this stuff can be quite lethal. But just a little bit at a time. Conchona bark gives bitterness that gives tonic water that real bitterness. Um, and so they put all of that in a container and it bubbles away for like a week. There's nothing unnatural that goes into it. It's just this wild, fermented, almost beerish product. And the end result is this really structural, really crunchy, amazing, complex tonic water and further mix a range. So move away from anything with 
just flavors shoved into a stainless steel container and go for one week of love amongst real whole fruits and botanicals. And I think the thing as well is like, if we're going to be upgrading on the ice, we're going to be using good citrus, we're going to be using all that, like, you know, we're trying to elevate the serve. There's no point then going for a really cheap tonic water that's not going to do justice to everything else. Like if you're going to go for something that's good, just do everything elevated. Especially if it doesn't cost you anything. And it comes in a glass bottle and it's got a cap that you, this comes off with a bottle opener and that just says quality. All right, uh, again, I'm just going to do some orange. Sweet vermouth with orange. That's always just been the way we've done things in bars. Yeah, it makes sense to me. Yeah, definitely. So I'll ask this question and we'll get back to it a bit later, um, just so you have a bit of time to think about it. Your top three gins each. Oh, um, well, I, I really like the ones we've done today, obviously. Um, I don't know. So I would definitely put Archie Rose in mine. Um, I'd probably go for... You know, I, I love Australian gins. Um, it would be quite a hard choice. I think they do they do bold really well, which I enjoy in a in a cocktail. If I was going to go for another one, it would probably be either probably be between the Never Never Distilling Co and West Winds. I think they they both do really big bold flavors. West Winds have um, some more uh, Australian botanicals in there, like the Bush Tomato, which is like savory, and I love savory uh, drinks. Yeah, they've also just been around for a really long time and they champion like indigenous communities and they yeah. work with local farmers and they tell a really good story and they make a really good gin. Um, I would put West Winds in my top three. I would also, even just from today, I put Hono really, really high. And if you were looking for something really traditional, then uh, in the heart of most bartenders is a gin called Plymouth, yeah. which comes from a place called Plymouth. Naked and strength, it's like it's, it's really sort of, punchy. We don't have a bottle. It's a, uh, it's very traditional. Uh, they they are still the only distillery in Plymouth. They used to service the Navy in England, and uh, they just get gin and tonics right, and they get martinis right, and that's all you really need out of a gin. Yeah. You go. Uh, I touched the ice. I know you did, didn't you? Yeah. I've Pretty showered, safe. so you're, you're lucky. Thanks. Hey, cheers. Yeah, that's really nice. And you know what? That it, the the um the berries in this. That's like going to bring in a whole new element. I'm trying to share glasses and give it a go. It's on me. I think that's really interesting. That's almost got elements of like that slow groaning I was talking about before. You use like a slow gin, um, quite, a, for, I guess, like a traditional, more autumnal flavor yeah. going on there. And because it's quite a sweet gin, some of the like raw tannins in that vermouth are sort of drying it out a little bit. It's really nice. Very cool. It's a really nice color. So remind us, uh, how'd you make this cocktail? Uh -huh. So it's just these two ingredients. And as a general rule, I've always gone five parts of the gin to two parts of the vermouth. So you would say, if you were using like a tablespoon at home, just do five tablespoons of the gin to two tablespoons of vermouth. And then we're just stirring it to get some, to get the right temperature and get some water through it and really let it open up. And then uh, we just put some orange in there. You can do that in the form of some skin or a wedge, or you can put some olives in there if you really like. It's totally up to you. But these drinks are very personal. Yeah. So we've left them with you in the home, and uh, and you can really play with them as much as you like. The thing about vermouth, so both of these, so having a sweet and a dry, it's one of the key elements you'll need if you're ever making cocktails at home. But don't leave them on your home bar sitting out. They need to be kept in the fridge because they're like an aromatized wine. So think of treating them like you would a bottle of white wine in your fridge. If you don't have a big copper spoon, get one. Where can you get one from? Uber Bar Tools. Everything they do is quality, it's heavy, so you know it's good. As I said, it doesn't go through airport security that well and you have to explain like some weird giant spoons to strangers. But it gives you an opportunity to talk about copper, which is nice. It's also really fun to twirl with the, yeah. There you go. So we've got a few more questions from home. Uh, yeah. Emily asks, uh, where do you go to find the best uh, cocktail recipes online? <laughs> um, Man, I go? would, I would, I would say uh, Difford's Guide is really good. Um, they have over five thousand recipes, and they're really easy to make. And you can also um, translate them into shots and mills and ounces. So whatever you uh, measure with. They got some good trivia on there as well, don't they? Yeah, great trivia, great trivia. And uh, Colleen uh, asks, if you were to make your own gin, what are the top five botanicals you would use? Oh, I think I'd go down the Australian She's route. She's going to talk about green capsicum. No, I, mean, <laughs> I do love savoury stuff. Do you know what? Green capsicum with a bush tomato. 
I'm just yeah, saying no, it yeah, hasn't been yeah. done. Um, I would definitely do that. I'd probably get some river mint in there. Australian river mint is really, really strong though. So you would honestly be doing a little bit. There's some really cool guys down in Melbourne that have been mapping out Australian botanicals and seeing how like much they distill. Um, obviously, you have to have juniper and probably some coriander. And yeah. I feel like acetrus. I I am a big fan of tankery number ten with the grapefruit, but I feel like they use just the garnish. But I probably play with that. What about you? Uh, my mum lives on a big piece of land in the Blue Mountains and she has bees and she makes lots of honey and she grows lots of onions and they and I would think that if I were to make a gin, I would start with juniper and then I would take the roots from all of her onions and, and coriander and things she's growing and I'd just make something that's really sentimental. Again, gin is just like a weird distilled salad or a distilled cocktail, so it's just got to be personal. I so I just take gin- everything my mum is growing in a garden and I put it in a still. We just made the two weirdest sounding gins ever. I don't think, I don't think we should be in charge of her. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, that's it at the moment, but um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank cool. you. How do we do for time? We're, we're going right on time. We're about uh, 40 minutes in. 40 minutes? We've got 20 minutes for magic. Uh, we've got one that's just come in. Uh, what are your top tips for bar presentation at home? I uh, learn a few one-liners. Uh, jokes are always very, very handy across the bar. It's about hospitality. So just make sure you've got something to keep people entertained while you are fumbling around on a granny recipe that you can't quite remember. Um, and be really clean because otherwise you annoy your significant other and they they just no one wants to pick up after you. I'd say like if, if you're trying to impress people with like how a cocktail looks, um, which, which is like half the battle sometimes, you know, when, you know, when, like you, you're in a bar and someone comes out with this amazing looking cocktail and was like, oh, I want one of those. But there is definitely an element to that, and it, it is just to do with your garnish, really. Like, just have a play with it. Cucumber ribbons in a gin and tonic sometimes, like on the inside of the glass, just stuff like that. Make an effort, you know, pop your raspberry in your clover club, make sure the zest is nice. I mean, like, freeze fruit like, into your ice cubes. Oh, that's good. That's actually really cute, but uh, that's good. Yeah, it, only if you're planning ahead of time. The right tools are important if you want to get those garnishes looking right. And really, like yeah. the first sip is with the eyes. So if you do want to get those things looking right, you know, um, the right tools are a great place to start. So having some sturdy stuff like this, uh, having you know, like good quality potato peelers so you can like just get long ribbons of yeah. cucumber or, or rhubarb or anything just sitting on top of a drink always looks like premium and also you're you're probably never going to be able to produce ice this clear if you're not buying it but using filtered or bottled water will get you a long way in your ice molds they're not going to be as cloudy as tap water colleen actually just asked her where do you get the best ice from large or large or small cubes work better so these ones are bare bones these are, yeah these guys are bare bones in sydney they service bars um, you can buy them though you can buy little packs of them they, so they do retail yeah. in certain places uh, there's a couple of places on Crown Street and Surrey Hills that sell yeah. them. But yeah, just worth Googling. Obviously, each state is different if because frozen Me- water doesn't travel very no, well. No, if you're down in Melbourne, um, Navy Strength Ice Co. is a really good brand. Um, they are the guys who run the Everly and Heartbreaker and Bar Margo. So definitely, they're very worth um, hitting up. If you're affluent or over the age of 50 and you have two freezers, then you could use one of them and fill up an esky with water and put that in your freezer because they're insulated, then your ice is frozen directionally and it does it so slowly that all of the water freezes first and all the bad stuff in water freezes last and they sort of make their way to the top. You can take it out of that esky and you can almost cut away the top layer and the bottom layer will be really clear. So that's a nice way of doing it at home. I don't have one of my drinks that are melting. Got a few more questions that uh, just Go come on. in. Uh, Piper Small asks, uh, the best place to find your garnishes to match your gin? Mum's Garden. Is that a fake name, Piper Small? Uh, I think it's a YouTube uh, handle. Oh, it's good. Um, again, it depends what gin you're using, but um, if you can grow anything yourself, again, it's just like, it's really personal. Like gin and tonics are personal, martinis are personal. So if you can uh, understand what you're tasting in your gin and then you go out and source what you think would pair with that, you know? Like, again, how do you make your bolognese? It's, you've got to go and find the right tomatoes and then you decide if you want to grate carrots into it or if you hate carrots. So, I mean, I with something like this, it says blackberry on the label, so it's a good place to start. But it's always a nice touch to add spices to, to things like black pepper or even a bit of salt or some chili. It's a, it's a good thing to do. Or if your mum has a garden, then just source that and just rate it. Yeah, and another thing with citrus that's always a good trick, something like um, 
a lime, obviously, like if it feels really hard and unripe, like you've sort of bought, you know, they're expensive and you, you know, it's really hard to get sometimes. Just give it a roll and like really get that kind of the juices going and it will kind of soften it up. You'll ha have a much easier time working with citrus when you do that. Are there any ingredients just don't work together? Like you should never match. No. I'd agree with that, actually. I think sometimes things can really surprise you. Like, Yeah. Also, whatever you've... Like, I've had some bad gin and tonics, but I'm sure some people would say that that was the best gin and tonic, as long as it's still bubbly. Um, yeah. yeah. Let's not be negative. Keep it light. Yeah. Everything can work. you just got to believe. It's all a ratio thing. And I used pepper before. What about salt? Salt in a gin and tonic can do something terrible, which is melt your ice. Salt in cocktails yeah. can do some wonderful things. Yeah. So salt, like in food, just helps pronounce flavors. So if you are making some gin cocktails, a pinch of salt in a few things is, is always a really nice touch and it's a bit of a secret. Yeah, definitely. And something like, even something like a pina colada, putting some salt yeah. in that, it's so good. It really brings all the elements out because otherwise you're just dealing with a lot of sweetness. So yeah, definitely. Got a couple more questions come in. Uh, which are your favorite bars for gin? Yeah, good. where's the question coming from? Don't answer that. We'll just uh, say a few across the country. If you're in Sydney, the best and biggest and most glistening gin bar is called The Barbershop. Um, it's filled with gentlemen with those things that hold your sleeve up and they know everything about gin that is to be known about gin. If you were in Melbourne, where would you go? I was going to say Gin Lane in Sydney, but there's a Gin Lane in Melbourne as well. Gin Palace. Gin Palace in Melbourne, Gin Lane in Sydney. Good. They're both very well stocked, very passionate guys um, working there. If you were in Queensland, you would go to a place called Mother's Ruin. Yeah. That's, that's I within think the Gresham quite... also has some really good. Cool. Yeah. And if you were in Perth, you would have about six bars to choose from, and they all are very talented. But uh, I was there recently. My notes would be Foxtrot and an incredible bar called. I'm not going to help you here. Is anyone from Perth? Go to Fox. Go to Fox. Yeah, and the thing is as well, it's not always just about like, the huge size of range you want. It's the talent of the guys as well. So Halford. I, I would Halford. Go to Halford. Well done. I'd also They're recommend so someone talented. like maybe Sammy. They do really, really good martinis. They have a martini trolley, so you're going to sit down and someone's going to wheel up a trolley and make a gorgeous martini for you. And that's an experience that you don't need 300 bottles on the back bar for. I just find the uh, best art of hospitality. Yeah, they honestly will give you um, such amazing service. They're either Italian or Slovakian, so take your pick. Uh, Jesse uh, asks, are we able to redo the cocktail at the very beginning? The please? Negroni, yeah, absolutely. Sure, I might have to mime it because I was quite ambitious with the pour, but let's, let's mime it. You would have sweet vermouth, so you would be reading a bottle that said Maidini sweet vermouth on it, and we'd go equal parts. So You stirred it first. I stirred it first. You stir over ice. You can make it in the glass if you're sort of like lacking equipment, I guess. But if you can stir it in a separate vessel first, just to get that more dilution and temperature um, drop, that's what you want to do. So equal parts. So however you want to measure it, just make sure it's the same every time. Are okay. we sort of up? We went for the Hono Gin, but what have you got most of? We went for Hono Gin, but we right now are going to use the Whitley Neal again because we've got a little bit of that. And then you would use Campari. We have a, we have, we have Campari. Incredible. Campari. You have basically been unchallenged in the bitter orange department. And what is Campari? It's a bitter herbal liqueur. It's known as an Amaro. There's a whole family of them and they all have really different tasting profiles. So you can't mix them in between each other. You couldn't grab a fernet, for example, and just take it out for a Campari, even though they're in the same family. Amaro is sort of like gin. It's like grain alcohol, but it's steeped in all of its botanicals, whereas gin is mainly distilled and it's at a lower ABV. But because it's steeped, it is those flavors that in this, like bitter orange, are far more pronounced. Really, really like aggressive tannins. But that's why the Italians love drinking them before food because it is meant to completely stimulate your palate. Go on. Look at that fancy one. Thank you. Have you been to Milano? No, never. Don't like it. <laughs> Just trying to be cool. Eek. I might not get a chance with this ice giving me no leeway. 
we have one last cube as well. It's open in the glass form. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> you made that purposely difficult. So you have a cool source. Jane from home asks, uh, can we rewatch this? It's been terrific. Uh, yeah, you can. Absolutely. Jane will tell you how. Yeah, it's on the um, the website, right? Oh, is it YouTube? App, YouTube, App. and Facebook. Okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Good job, Jane. Yeah, nailed it. So yeah, this, like I said, the Negroni is such an easy drink. Once you kind of just get the stirring down, you're equal parts. You can't go wrong. Like, don't even, you don't even need to remember, like, Quantities just remember equal parts, and that's the beauty. Like you, if you just don't over over dilute it at first, because it will be a bit strong, and then it's going to be perfect, and then it's going to be a bit weak at the end. And if you're using a really light sweet vermouth, you're going to get a really light Negroni. If you're using a really heavy sweet vermouth like Winter Mass, you're going to get a really bitter, heavy Negroni. But it can be made in it. Like again, all these drinks are so personal, and we chose them for that reason because you won't be able to mess them up. You'll just get different personalities out of each cocktail. We did a twist last time, but this time we're just going to do a big wedge of orange. Nice. Beautiful. You can see, like, the colour difference when we made the first one is obviously a little bit darker because we're working with, I guess, all the different products. There, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Whilst you're enjoying your Negronis there, uh, shout out to Anne, Annie and Sue. They've got a question. Sorry, just reading it in very small font. Uh, it's a question about pairing their garnishes and how to influence non-garnish lovers over the various garnishes. How do you know which ones to work with which gins, basically? How do you pick and pack match? I would look at the botanical list primarily first on, on what a gin has in it. Because then if there's anything unusual that stands out to you, sort of like your lavender, rosemary, black pepper, um, that's something fun to get creative with that they've sort of told you that's already you're going to find in the gin. So you're just amplifying it. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to work. Like with Archie Rose, we know there's river mint, so we have mint. It's at every Woolworths. It's really easy to come by. Um, the only other build on that, I would say, is garnishes that you can also eat are really fun. So if you do that's have a true. big wedge of orange, it gives you a chance to interact with your drink and then eat the garnish, which is great. So far, far too often we go to a bar, we order a drink, they make it, you pay Australian currency, and you get your drink, and there's no interaction. Whereas if you have you know, some olives or a big wedge of orange and you got to play with your food a little bit and then eat it, it just creates a bit more of a bond between you and your cocktail, which is nice. Yeah, and I think as well, you probably have some idea of what flavors go well with cooking. So for example, one of my favorite things is rosemary and black pepper. And like, that's a really classic thing you do in cooking anyway. So just, I, I think you probably know lots of flavor pairings already. Um, just add them to a drink. A few more questions are coming in. Uh, Sarah actually asked too, uh, what berries are used to make slow gin and, and what is slow gin for those at home? Yes, yeah, so slow it's called Never berry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so slow is a, um, like a berry that you find in, in England. It's really autumnal, so it tends to grow in, along the hedgerows. There's like lots of wild berries come out in autumn. Um, it tends to be a lot lower of ABV, but there are brands that are in Australia that have a slow gin. So um, Chase. Chase has a slow Chase gin. Chase has a slow gin. Um, but they're from England. But they are in Australia, like you can buy it. Yeah. Uh, West Winds actually have a, a plum gin that's really similar, actually. So you could you could work with that as well. Uh, so with you, native plums. Yeah. So if you're feeling patriotic, then that's a good one. Yeah. They just yeah they just tend to be a lot sweeter, much more yeah berries. People used to make slow gin a lot themselves, actually, just by getting gin and sticking slow berries in it. Yeah, it's just macerating gin with slow berries. So it drops the alcohol content a little bit because you're getting juice. And it brings up the sugar level a little bit because you're getting the sweetness from the fruits. And then you can just drink it over ice or you can like put some soda water in it or you can just like have quite a bit of it while you're cooking dinner because it's that lower alcohol piece yeah. and it's more palatable on its own. Sarah also asks, uh, what is Navy strength? Cool one. Uh, I'm going to dive into a little bit of history. Please don't. <laughs> so I would say that Navy strength came about when England's trying to take over the world and Plymouth Gin uh, putting lots lots of gin into tanks on ships, but sometimes you, there's some rough seas and that gin would spill onto the gunpowder. And if your gunpowder gets wet, then it's really hard to kill anybody else. So what they did was they put the, the strength up for the Navy, Navy strength, to a point where it would, if it could spill onto your gunpowder, it would still light on fire. So it's high enough proof that you can start an open flame with it 
and murder your enemies. And then sailors like that because it gets you pissed a bit faster. So like a normal gin, you're looking at somewhere between what, 35 to 40% ABV, maybe yeah. a bit higher. With Navy strength, you're up to like what, 55? Yeah, you'd be close to 55. Yeah. So it's just a, it's just a boozier gin. I think there's a really technical number and it's like 57 points. Yeah, yeah. Something. And it's the same, like you hear the term overproof as well. That's the same concept, just a, a, a boozier booze. It just hasn't been diluted down. Not that we're saying blow anyone up. Uh, Mac Henry's in Tassie does a slow So gin. good. Yeah, that's another 60% really good one. instead of 40. How good, yeah. So if I were looking for a great quality slow gin, I'd be looking for a higher proof as well. Uh, West Winds is still sitting at a pretty 39. Brookies do a, a nice one as well, which they spell with a W instead of an E at the end of slow, which I think is a pun. So I prefer them lower strength because when I go for a slow Negroni or slow gin Negroni, I want something that's gentler than a normal Negroni. Otherwise, I just have a Negroni. That's like my personal take on it. I Sometimes I want like a creepy pm sipper. Over crippling masculinity problems and I just want something that high proof and I want people to know I'm drinking high proof so I would say that McHenry's out of Tasmania make an absolutely stunning they, product. I don't know if they want to be linked to that issue. <laughs> uh, I'm self-conscious drink McHenry's. Josh uh, Bone asks a uh, very important question uh, who are you wearing tonight? Thanks Josh. Um... <laughs> I got this on a friend of mine so I'm not sure. Um... These are hand-me-downs. This Thank is uh, something I got at Finders Keepers Market. Uh, it's a, a, a well, not entirely brand. unlike a Cavalin Botanical. <laughs> Don't actually know the name of the brand, but um. more important question: Colleen asks, uh, when pairing with food, uh, what's the kind of best gin and tonics or cocktails that you kind of, you know, what we've talked about tonight? Has that work for food? Definitely. So the Negroni that we've already like made again and we started with is a really good one for the beginning of the evening. If you have like antipasta plates out, you sort of got, you know, meat, cheeses, maybe some olives. That's going to go really well because that's a tried and tested, um, I guess, pairing. Uh, if we go into something, I mean, like going into main dishes, I'd still keep things light if you're like having gin cocktails, to be honest. Like you, you'd want something... I guess like Middle, e Mid uh, sorry, Middle Eastern salads, something like with pomegranates, fresh mint, like yogurt drizzles, that kind of stuff. Yeah. If you are just a giant fan of the curry, then the whiskey, that's all like the malted barley based things with like, uh, with Mediterranean spices and things going through them is, is a really good way to go. Yeah. Again, I don't, I don't want to harp on about it, but it's very personal. So, you know, there's, there's great books in the world called Red Wine with Fish. There's great books about, uh, you know, gin and tonic pairings with food. But at the end of the day, you know, are you eating good food and are you refreshed? That's that's really how you yeah. want to be thinking. I, I go down savory routes if you're going with like garnishes and gins and stuff. Just I wouldn't put anything really sweet if you're eating the main things. That's the only kind of thing I would sort of say. So like the um, West Winds that we mentioned with those savory notes with the bush tomatoes, I think they'll be a really fun pairing to play with. They also go well over the top of the salad. Uh, Jason from the audience goes, I can see other Fentimans behind you. What are the other tonics? Thanks, Jason. Appreciate that. So Fentimans have a huge range of tonics. We're in the country at the moment. There's a, a good range. Um, so there's the Indian tonic, which will rival any other Indian tonic. And as we said, it sits with amongst its whole botanicals for at least a week and just bubbles around, which means there's a little bit of alcohol in all of them, which is a nice touch. And then you've got Valencian orange. We've got a pink grapefruit. There's a light. And there's my favorite one, which is called Connoisseur, which is that bitter bark stuff that makes tonic water taste awful. Uh, they halve that. So if anyone doesn't, not a huge fan of tonic, they halve that bitter aspect. And it works really, really well for some lighter gins, like your Hendrix's or your like, uh, what's a light gin we've had today? Like um, your, like even like a Roku with the yeah, Fentiman's Connoisseur, you'll, you'll get lots of, you'll, you won't drown out that cherry blossom you'll be able to really feel the juniper and the ginger coming through a lot easier because it's not competing with that abrasive flavor that is tonic water. They also do ginger beer, which is the single greatest ginger beer on the face of the earth. They do a dry ginger. They do a rose lemonade, which I think they stole all their roses from Chanel number no. five. So it's luxe. Very, very cool. So uh, definitely one to check out. It's a game changer. Awesome. And uh, just as kind of we start wrap, wrapping up for tonight, do you mind I'll just highlighting all the bottles again for sure yeah right? absolutely so Let's if we start uh, from the beginning so we had um tanglin at the beginning i'm gonna put the vermouths to my left and your right okay so this is the first gym we had 
um, this one here. So that one is the one from Singapore that we had in the Negroni. Uh, next, we had the Hanuk from Sweden. That's a really nice traditional gin. Uh, next, we had Aviation, which is Ryan Reynolds gin. Lavender is the key note there. Uh, we next went for the Archie Rose. This is the Australian gin. This is the one that had all those lovely Australian botanicals. We're going to have to keep shuffling this way. Sorry. Work clean. Sorry. Yeah, I know. We've made a mess. Um, the Roku Japanese gin. This one, which actually it has six sides. So there you go. Simon Diffid was wrong. Can you tilt to face the camera? Oh, yeah. So it's in that kind of shape of a bottle. So there you go. Um, all right. Next, we're going with the Kavalan from Taiwan. Tell me if this gets out of frame for you guys. Milk and honey from Tel Aviv. And then finally, the Whitley Neal from England. Just sort of. <laughs> there we go. So those are the ones we had. Thick water. So good. Perfect. All right. I think we're out of time for tonight. That is. Any final words for gin lovers at home? I would say if you're building a gin bar at home, remember your mixes, your Campari, your vermouths, because otherwise you're just going to end up with a whole range of gins that you can only drink like, as gin. So just remember that as much as it's really exciting to try lots of new gins, um, you're going to want to mix things. And that's the whole point of tonight, showing you that like you can't just buy this and think you've got a, a home bar ready to go. So just, yeah. I would say that uh, my background is in cocktail bars and I've read a lot of books. And this wasn't a question of bragging. And uh, yeah, I'm married, so uh, no, I would say that most classic cocktails in the world, like 90% of them, were made with gin. So uh, get on Diffid's Guide and get a book and, like, you know, master the Negroni, but move on because there's a huge amount of classic cocktails in the world. And if you've got a good gin cabinet, you can pretty much make all of them. Yeah, absolutely. And then just enjoy and have fun and, like, make up your own recipes and make mistakes. And, you know, the more you have, the the worse it will get as the night goes on and you just have fun with it. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks everyone at home. If there's any final questions, uh, drop us a line on our Facebook page, Virtual Gin Show. Don't forget uh, to download the Whiskey List app. Uh, all the gins are for sale tonight, so you can jump on, rate your favorite gins, uh, add it to your cart, check out, and then they'll be delivered in a few days later. Uh, thanks to Fentimans for their support tonight and Uber Bar Tools for sponsoring this lovely location on site to make um, the filming, they make awesome epic uh, bar tools. They've got little, uh, you know, ice chippers, all the different flavors, all the different colors, gold, copper, even uh, a matte black now. So I uh, support the guys there. This is all about supporting local as well. So thanks to our special guests, uh, Jane and John tonight. Uh, yeah, any other questions, uh, send them through. We'll hopefully answer that. But uh, thanks again, and we'll see you at the next uh, virtual uh, show. I think we've got the World Whiskey Show is the next one coming on what day? 13th. 30th? 30th of, Three, 30th of October. So tickets are still on sale now, so jump on the Virtual Whiskey Show if you want to be a part of that. Uh, but, yeah, thank you to Jane and John. Thanks, guys. Cheers.